presentation on the after and afternoon of the first ladies. I'm going to be covering a little bit about the lives of some of the lesser known first ladies. Uh, Dr. Hurd is a nationally recognized presidential historian specializing in the personal side of the presidency. He is a lifelong collector of presidential memorabilia and has a museum quality collection which exceeds 8,000 pieces. He is an author of two books, the most recent of which is Symbols of Patriotism, First Ladies and Daughters of the American Revolution, released in December 2020. He has lectured at numerous events in historic places, including several programs for the National Park Service. Dr. Cook has worked on several projects for President Jimmy Carter and has been a historical memorabilia consultant for the former president. He has developed a close fr fr friendship with President Carter, as well as making several appearances with him, including a historic interview. Recently, he was appointed to the Vandermeer Press, Count Press Authors Council and notified of his award of the prestigious Ella Dickey Literacy Award, which recognizes a national author who has contributed to the preservation of history. Well, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. And uh, it's an honor to be here. I love to speak to uh, historical societies and museums. And, and, uh, and I thank you for, for all that you do there uh, for keeping history alive uh, and promoting history. That's, that's really one of my goals uh, is to really, really continue to promote history. As you mentioned, the personal side of the presidency is really my forte. Um, I got into doing more about the First Ladies. I'll give you a little background on that. Uh, I was asked to speak about two years ago to, a, uh, to the Wyoming Valley chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And uh, of course, I knew some First Lady history from, from, uh, from studying the presidents so much, but I really hadn't spoken too much on, on First Ladies in general. And uh, so I thought, well, let me look into it and see if there's any first ladies that belong to the Daughters of the American Revolution uh, for that talk two years ago. And doing a quick search, and I found that there were like five of them, with Caroline Harrison being the first president general of the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution. And I thought, well, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. And so I, I geared that, that talk toward that, and it was a big hit. People loved it. And it was ironic because I started to get more requests to do more talks on first ladies or i get a lot of questions from the audiences when i did uh presidential ones and, and people would be asking more about about their wives uh, more and more so um i have a friend of mine i have several friends that are historians of course and and told one of my friends about that uh that talk that i did for the dar and he said well you ought to write a book on that and so i said well i'll, I'll do a little more research and see and i came up with 12 first ladies that were in the Daughters of the American Revolution. And so that book really, or that finding really changed my career uh, somewhat. I do still do the same thing. I still do the, the presidential thing, but now with the new book coming out, I'm getting a lot of, lot of requests for the first ladies. And, it, and it's really given me, um, it's been fun for me because it's given me a whole lot more knowledge about the first ladies and the significant role that they they play. Um, as you mentioned, I have a large collection I've collected since I was 10 years old. Uh, someone, George, I think it was, was asking me before uh, about my age. I'm 61 now, so I've been collecting for about 51 years. So I've accumulated quite a few pieces, some of which I'll show you today. Um, I'm very excited because I just purchased a Julia Grant letter, which has not arrived yet. So I was kind of hoping it would be here for this, this uh, event, but I uh, should have it any day. Um, so now I've tried to acquire memorabilia on, on more first lady memorabilia as well as, as presidential. So uh, I've been doing this for a while. So I'll show you some of the, some of the things that I've chosen out of my collection for, for this talk. As, as we talk, um, I'll be moving around a little bit. I apologize about that. I was telling Sarah earlier that it's a whole lot easier in person. I love to walk around, pick up memorabilia, interact with the audience. Uh, but she asked me if I've been doing a lot of Zoom presentations, and yes, I have over this last uh, year, year and a half. So um, with that, we'll, we'll get started a little bit, and uh, with, we'll talk kind of in order here. Uh, Julia Grant uh, is one of the six that we decided to highlight today, and I really enjoy talking about Julia Grant, and you know, you're probably going to hear me say that six times because I really enjoy talking about all these first ladies, but... Um, Julia Grant was really a very unlikely first lady 
in, in, in the first place. Uh, she came from a plantation uh, slave owning family from the South. And of course she married uh, Ulysses Grant, uh, who you know, came from an abolitionist family. So it was pretty unlikely that those two would get together anyway. They got together because while Ulysses was in West Point, uh, he, his roommate and good friend was Julia's brother, Frederick Dent Grant. And uh, Frederick really, uh, really liked Ulysses, really uh, respected him and said, you've got to meet my sister. So he's the one that introduced uh, Ulysses to Julia and changed history. So I like to say that, that she was a very unlikely first lady. And all through her time with Ulysses and through her time as first lady, she was able to really walk that line very uh, respectably between uh, coming from a Southern plantation family and being married to Ulysses Grant. And she really was able to walk that line and, and never get into really any big conflicts or really uh, offend anybody on either side and, and really did a remarkable job with that. Uh, one thing with Julia that really, really intrigues me is her uh, premonitions that she had. Uh, they were almost like uh, psychic premonitions of greatness for Ulysses. Ulysses was a very successful general, as we all know, very successful in the military, but he was not successful in business uh, before the presidency and after the presidency. As a matter of fact, while he was dying, that's why he wrote his memoirs, which is a whole nother story, but um, he, he had gotten uh, involved in a, a Ponzi scheme uh, and uh, had really lost everything shortly before he died, so that's why he wrote his his memoir. So even after being president, he was never successful in business. But Julia always had premonitions of greatness for him. And she would even tell people, well, you just wait until he becomes president. Uh, and that was way before the presidency was even on the radar for either one of them. And I just find that just really remarkable. Uh, I'm going to turn around here and get this rather large lithograph from the time period. And you can see Abraham Lincoln there and shaking his hand is Julia Grant. And they're at a big White House uh, reception in this lithograph. And I'm holding it up there a little longer so you know you can get a look at it and I apologize for any of the glares. But um, as you notice in that photo or in that lithograph, Julia is pictured in profile. And most of her pictures, renditions, of course, back then there weren't a whole lot of photos. There are some photos of Julia out there. Uh, most of them are in profile because Julia was born with strabismus. And for those of you who don't know what strabismus is, the slang for it is cross-eyed. And so out of respect, she was never really photographed or uh, renditions done of her straight on because of, of her eyes being, uh, being cross-eyed, so to speak, from the strabismus. And most people think of Ulysses, I have a 1860s cabinet card here of Ulysses uh, in his uniform. And most people think of him as kind of a uh, gruff looking Civil War general but he was really quite a romantic. And I love that. Uh, when Julia started to get more into the public with her husband being a famous general, she got very conscious of her strabismus. And she wanted to have surgery, which at that time would have been very experimental, uh, done to try to correct her, her eyes. And when she went to Ulysses and told him that, he begged her not to do it. And he said, I don't want you to do that because those are the eyes that I fell in love with. And I want you to keep those eyes. And you don't really expect that to come out of somebody you, you, you think of as a gruff Civil War general. Another story that I love about Julia and Ulysses that shows his, his romantic side is actually when he proposed to Julia. Uh, they actually saw each other, I believe, only 
maybe twice after the proposal before they were married because he was in the military then. And um, it was it was very difficult for them to be apart. But they when he actually proposed to her, they were out on a buggy ride and it had just rained and the, the creeks were swollen and, and kind of rapid and they had to go over a bridge and Julia was afraid to go over the bridge. And he stopped and, and convinced her that he would make it over the bridge safely and told her just to cling to his arm and, and it would be fine. And when they got to the other side of the bridge, uh, he proposed to her saying that, you know, you clung to, your, to my arm going over the bridge. I would like you to cling to me for the rest of your life. And, um, and, and so, you know, again, I, I, I know this is about Julia, but I love portraying uh, Ulysses as a, as a romantic because people don't think of that. And, and I just had the opportunity, uh, I was just in Missouri and I, I host a, a presidential family panel there, uh, which is one of the biggest events uh, at, that, at that whole event. There's many, many programs that go on at that event. But uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, Ulysses and Julia's great, great grandson on the panel. And, um, and he was talking about how much of a romantic his great, great grandfather was. He's got a cool name. His name is Ulysses Grant Dietz. And uh, I just think that's a, a very cool name. And, uh, and he went on to say that, you know, of course, with Grant's tomb, where, where uh, President Grant and Julia are, are, are entombed, um, it was very important for the Grants that they would be entombed together. So that, uh, you know, that love affair just goes on endlessly. But um, another thing with Julia that I find remarkable is during the, during the Civil War, she would visit uh, the Civil War camps and to the soldiers. She would visit the camps where Ulysses was. And of course, that kind of caused a little little bit of controversy among the troops when when uh, a wife came in or a female came in. But an interesting thing is that she would bring uh, with her her slave Jewel, uh, who would also render aid to the uh, to the wounded soldiers there. And, and and of course that's very, very ironic that here her her husband is in charge of the, the Union Army in a civil war that's that's fighting slavery, yet she she would bring Jewel with her to the civil war camps. And uh, and they would both work there as, as medical workers. And that's what I met early on when I said she was able to walk that that line between the North and the South uh, with with people that she loved on both sides of that and uh, and and did it uh, very, very well. Um, the final thing about Julia is that, again, has irony to it, is that after uh, Ulysses died, uh, Julia became very, very good friends with Verina Davis. Uh, and uh, if you don't know who Verina Davis was, uh, she was Jefferson Davis's wife. And they both lived in New York City. And after the death of their husbands, uh, they both became very close friends. And at the Missouri Festival that I was just at and hosted the presidential panel or the president's family panel, also on my panel uh, was a man by the name of Bertram Hayes Davis, who is Jefferson Davis's great, great grandson. So I had the great, great grandson of Ulysses Grant and the great, great grandson of Jefferson Davis on my panel. And it was just, I, I, I know both of them well, I've, I've met them both before, and it's just so cool though to have them both uh, on the panel and got my picture taken with him. I said, when am I going to have this opportunity? You know, so um, so that was um, that was really great. Um, the next one that we'll talk about again, I said you're going to hear me say this six times, but uh, is uh, Francis Cleveland, and I have a lithograph of Francis here, and I'm gonna bring it down a little bit. And framed with that is a, I know we're getting glare there, I'm sorry. Framed with that is a, a check signed by Francis. Now there's a lot to say about, I love talking about Francis Cleveland and Grover Cleveland because there's so much uh, little known history there uh, with them. But uh, I mentioned how uh, Ulysses and Julia met, 
uh, it's quite a different story for how uh, Francis and Grover met. Grover was best friends and law, law partner with Oscar Folsom, who was uh, Francis's father. And actually Grover was best friends with him when Francis was born. And Grover actually bought a uh, baby carriage as a gift for uh, the Folsoms for the new baby. Now, when she was about uh, 10 years old, 10 or 11 years old, uh, unfortunately, Oscar Folsom was killed in a buggy accident and he had no will. So the court appointed Grover to be a trustee and to watch over uh, Mrs. Folsom and Francis. And he did that and he did that very well and he made sure that they were cared for and uh, that, they, that they didn't ever need anything. Uh, when Francis went off to college is when a correspondence romance occurred between the, between the two. And he was president at that time. I know people are cringing at that. I see Sarah cringing there. Uh, but it was, it was just strictly correspondence. Grover went to uh, Mrs. Folsom and told her uh, about it. Uh, and she was all for it. She was, uh, she was all for it. He actually proposed to Francis through a letter even. So, um, and, and I really like this story because we all know how the press is now and, and anybody in the public eye, especially a presidency can't get away with anything without, you know, the press is all over it. And the press back then was not, not, you know, a whole lot different. They were all over everything. And uh, it was a big, it was a big thing that the, the president was a single man and they kind of knew that he was romantically involved with somebody, but they were dying to find out who it was. And, and they were all guessing that it was actually Francis's mother. You know, that would have been more age appropriate, of course. And they were all guessing that it was her. And uh, as I mentioned, Grover uh, proposed through, through a letter and they didn't release the engagement to the public until five days before the wedding. So they, they were able to keep it a secret. Uh, I'll talk about another secret that, that Grover kept too, that's uh, not very well known, but um, they kept it a secret. They were married in the White House, the only president to be married in the White House. And she was 21 years old on the day of her wedding. And he was 49. And you know, you think, wow, that's something. But when you really think about it, she was a 21 year old first lady. And that just amazes me. At 21 years old, you are the first lady of the United States. Again, Grover was president when they were married in the blue room of the White House. So um, that's really remarkable to think a 21 year old could, could uh, be first lady. And, and she continues to be, of course, the youngest first lady in, in American history. But um, they, when they were, uh, I kind of lost what I was going to say there for a second, but um, when they served in the White House, their term, and then Benjamin Harrison came and uh, won the next election when Grover was trying to run for re-election, Francis told them, told the White House staff that we will be back. And don't change too much in the White House because we will be back. And she was absolutely right because four years later, uh, they ran against Benjamin Harrison. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because we're going to talk about Caroline. But uh, they won the White House back. And so she was absolutely right. And marrying her uh, and winning the White House back probably saved Grover's life because Shortly after they came in for their second term, which was non-consecutive, uh, and for those of you who are history buffs out there, he's the only president to, to win two non-consecutive terms in the White House, and he's forever messed up the presidential numbering system because he's the 22nd and 24th president. And uh, as you all know, Joe Biden is the 46th president, but there've only been 45 men to be president because of Grover Cleveland. So anyway, um, got off on that little aside there, but when they were back in the White House in their first year, Grover developed uh, a lesion in his mouth. 
And uh, he went to Francis about that and she immediately called the White House doctor. And the White House doctor uh, looked at the lesion in his mouth and immediately knew that it was cancer. And I find that uh, amazing. Uh, I, I, I have a background in the medical field. And so I love the medical side of, of things to do with the presidency and the uh, diagnostic abilities of some of these old time doctors were just fantastic. But he, as I mentioned, recognized that it, it was or diagnosed it as, as being cancer and said that it had to be removed. Now, Grover was adamant about not letting anybody know that he was gonna have this operation. And no one knew except for he, his wife, four doctors, and a friend of his who owned a big boat that they could put out on the, the East River. And so they proceeded to get the doctors on board. Uh, they strapped Grover to a, to a chair, strapped the chair to a, a something in the, in the bottom of the boat and proceeded to do surgery on Grover's mouth, which turned out to be very, very extensive. Uh, I, I can't believe he lived through it. Uh, if any of you are from the medical field, you'll know that your your head and your mouth is very vascular. So you know if you do surgery there, you could you could bleed very heavily. And they they took the tumor out. Uh, and um, I, I mentioned before about the press. And of course, when the press hadn't seen the president in a couple of days, they were starting to get antsy and wondering what was wrong. And Grover's an av avid fisherman. So what they did after that, like two days, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, after the operation, they put Grover out on a boat to go fishing, but they put him far enough out so the reporters could see him from shore, but they couldn't ask him anything. And so and it was pretty amazing. They had a, uh, a doctor who specialized in prosthetics on, on board. He made a prosthesis for Grover's mouth uh, right immediately after the surgery. And I believe Grover only had that prosthesis uh, changed one time. So, uh, like, uh, yeah, I see a couple of a couple of guys here in the audience, which is nice to see on the first ladies ones because it's the ladies always want me to talk about the first ladies. It's great to have guys in there because I can't talk about them without talking about the presidents too. But um, as we all know, it's our wives that make us go to the doctors lots of times, and and uh, you know Grover and Francis were were no different. So, um, so actually she, she probably saved his life. Uh, another little aside, a personal aside, I mentioned the Missouri festival I was at. Uh, a good friend of mine is George Cleveland, Grover and Francis's grandson. And yes, grandson, not great grandson. Uh, because of the age difference, uh, Grover had uh, George's father very late in life and then George's father had George very late in life. So, um, so I'm good friends. We, we did a, a several events together in, in Missouri and he looks a lot like his grandfather. He looks a lot like Grover Cleveland. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the Harrisons came in and challenged, uh, or Benjamin Harrison came in and challenged Grover uh, for reelection and, and won that election making uh, Benjamin Harrison the 23rd president and uh, Caroline Harrison first lady. And, I'll show you, I really have to reach around here for a few things. Uh, one thing I, I did want to show you here getting back is this is a, uh, an, actually an advertising card with uh, Francis Cleveland on it. And if you could see underneath, it says Mrs. President Cleveland. Even then, they, you know, they didn't really know what to call the first lady. Um, and she was referred to as Mrs. President, uh, you know, her name, uh, a, a variety of things. So for, from Martha Washington up until, you know, almost into 1900, there really wasn't a standard uh, thing to, to call the first lady. So I like that cabinet card because it, it really shows, uh, you know, really shows that. Um, so as I mentioned, the Harrisons came in making Caroline Harrison the first lady. Um, Caroline Harrison's uh, goal right out of the gate being first lady was to do renovations in the White House. It, a lot of these earlier first ladies uh, and into the, even into the, uh, 
the 20th century uh, did renovations on the on the White House. And some people will ask me, they'll say, well, how come the White House needed so many renovations all the time? And the the answer to that is, is the White House was a lot more public place than it is now. Uh, you know, people could walk in and just walk in in Abraham Lincoln's time, they would walk in and wait in line to see Abraham Lincoln or other presidents from, you know, from that time. It actually was very disturbing for the presidents because they, they couldn't get a lot of work done because so many people were bothering them. But you imagine the foot traffic that went through the White House in those times when it was an open door thing. And, uh, and also people are people and they would take souvenirs and uh, you know chip wood off of things and, and take things and because it was in the White House. So uh, you know, frequently the White House needed updating and, and repairs and new carpets and, and all that kind of stuff. So Caroline was really in pretty rough shape when Caroline uh, went in there. She tried to secure a whole lot of money, build an addition on the White House and all of that, but didn't get everything that she wanted. But she did get a fair amount of money to, uh, to renovate. And one of the things that she put in the White House that was never there before was electricity. And so once they got the electricity in, they thought, well, this is great, except for one thing, both she and the president were scared to death to touch the light switches. And so they would leave the lights on all night long and they would wait for an employee to come in in the morning to shut the lights off because they wouldn't touch they wouldn't touch the light switches, and and I find that really neat because you know we're all scared of technology today. You know we're, we're like on our phone or computer saying, oh, what if I hit the wrong button? What if it goes off? What if you know what if my computer crashes? But so you know electricity was their technology at that time, and uh, so I just I just love that. Um, when Caroline was first lady, she she was never in really good health. She always had chronic uh, lung problems. So she had her uh, niece, Mary Lord Dimmick, come in and uh, help her with her first lady duties. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about Mary in a, in a little bit. But uh, Caroline was also a very proficient uh, China painter. And for some of you that know Victorian history, China painting was really, the thing to do back then. It was like, you know, like we've been through scrapbooking and all that stuff now. Well, China painting was really the thing. And uh, Caroline was a very good artist and China painter and she painted a lot of China, really started the first uh, White House China uh, collecting and, and China display. And she would find China pieces from previous administrations and put them out on display. So she really started that and that was continued on by Edith Roosevelt. But um, the, the uh, other part, I was going to save this to Florence Harding, but I'll tell you now uh, that when Warren Harding was president, he had poker games in the White House, and he actually gambled off a set of Caroline Harrison's uh, White House China during a poker game. But um, as I mentioned, Caroline was in, in, uh, in very ill health uh, most, of her, most of her life. And I have a letter here from Benjamin Harrison, and I'll show you. This was dictated and written in a secretary's hand, but he he signed it. And I'm, there's his signature right there. And in the in the dictated letter, he says, Mrs. Harrison continues to suffer from nervous prostration and makes a very tedious recovery. I don't know when I will be able to get away to, I don't know when I will be able to get her away or to get away myself for a little rest, which I very much need. And about three months later, Caroline passed away as first lady in the White House. And uh, I get chills every time I hold that letter or every time I, I, I read that letter because uh, that says so much about uh, the president and first lady as as people that's what i try to get across to to everyone that they're all people just like us they were just people that were sometimes sought out but sometimes were thrown into extraordinary circumstances and you can feel his his uh humanness in that in that letter both for for his wife and himself with meeting 
needing to get uh, rest. Now, she passed away, as I mentioned, three months after that letter was written as First Lady and just two weeks prior to Election Day. So imagine the stresses there on President Harrison. He's running for re-election. The election's not going well, and it didn't go well for him. Grover Cleveland won the election. Um, and, uh, and his wife passes away two weeks prior you know, to that. Um, now, I mentioned Mary Lord Dimmick, her, Caroline's niece, who was there uh, helping her with, with the White House uh, duties. Now, she, uh, about three years later, married Benjamin Harrison. And that caused a big rift in the Harrison family. I have an envelope here that's signed by Mary Lord Harrison. And that's called free franking up there. If you, if you were the, uh, the president or the wife of a former president, um, you don't have to pay for postage. You just had to sign your name up at the top. And then on the other side, it's in small letters, but if you can see it, it says Mrs. Benjamin Harrison on the other side of the, of the envelope. And I also wanted to show you, this is a uh, inaugural ball program from the Harrison's inaugural ball from 1889. Caroline also was uh, responsible for the tradition of the Christmas tree in the White House. So I know a lot of, a lot of you would enjoy hearing that, that she started the first White House Christmas tree. So her, her legacy in the White House is really uh, the electricity, the Christmas tree, and the, the China display in the, in the White House. I'm going to talk a little bit about Edith Roosevelt. I know some of you were talking about her. Uh, I don't know, somebody said they would marry Teddy Roosevelt if they had the chance, I think, before we, we started here. So um, yeah, Edith was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's second wife. Um, Edith and Teddy were actually each other's first playmates when they were old enough to, to be, have playmates at two, three years old. Uh, they lived next, their families lived next door to one another. And the one thing that I think is really cool, at four years old, they both stood together and watched Abraham Lincoln's funeral pass by uh, in, in New York City. And that's just one of those little pieces of history that I just think are, are, are really neat. Um, they, as they got older into their, into their teens, uh, they probably were technically kind of boyfriend, girlfriend a little bit, uh, but the relationship just never went really much beyond being friends. And then, uh, you know, Teddy went off and, and he was always doing his uh, adventures and, and doing 100 different things. And uh, he married uh, Alice. And so Alice and Teddy's mother both ended up passing away on the same day in the same house. Uh, the, shortly after their daughter, Alice, was born. And that's what spurred Teddy's trip to go out west. Uh, you know, it put him into a tailspin. He left baby Alice with his sister and he went out west and, and did more of his adventures and stuff out there. Um, had he not gone out west again, that would have, you know, that would have changed history. But when he came back, um, Edith was, was still very good friends with, with one of Teddy's sisters. And when he came back from his Western adventures, um, he went over to his sister's house and one time and Edith was there and they uh, started to see each other out of respect for his wife who had passed away. They kept the relationship secret for a year or a little more uh, before they considered getting married and, and announced to people that they were, uh, that they were getting married. But, um, so that was kind of like uh, uh, something you see right off of a movie or something where, you know, they knew each other, kind of boyfriend, girlfriend, get separated apart, and then are uh, rejoined uh, as a result, actually, of tragedy. Um, she would, would say that, that Teddy was really her, uh, 
her, her fifth child. Um, she would, you know, uh, she would watch over him very, very carefully. She worried about him working too much. She put her office in next to his so she could kind of keep a closer eye on him and make sure he was eating his lunch and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, she actually purchased a, uh, a, a cabin called Pine Knot out in rural Virginia uh, for a place for him to get away and relax a little bit. But what Teddy didn't know is she had ordered a secret service agent to hide in the woods anytime Teddy was in the cabin to keep an eye on, on him. And Teddy never, he never knew that, that the secret service agent was there. So he thought he was out there all alone and just relaxing, but there was somebody, there was somebody indeed um, keeping an eye on him. Um, she was an excellent White House hostess. As I mentioned earlier, she continued with the, with the China display. Um, and she even completed a set of China that had been started that Caroline Harrison had started to get uh, purchased. And she completed it in honor of Caroline Harrison, which I think is just a really a cool thing. She was thinking about history, thinking about the first ladies that had been there before her and, and continued that on for Caroline. And um, she was also responsible for hiring the first uh, White House usher. And she was also the first first lady to have a, uh, a paid assistant. And what they did with that is they kind of, kind of typical politics, I guess, but they brought in a person under the, the guise of an assistant for assistant to the president for planning Alice's wedding, his daughter Alice's wedding, which Edith helped to plan. That must have been one heck of a wedding to try to plan with Alice Roosevelt. Um, I know some of you are familiar with her and how she was uh, from what we were talking prior to the, this program starting, but you know, I think it sums it up when one of her favorite uh, quotes was, if you don't have anything good to say about somebody, come over here and sit next to me. Uh, Teddy would say, Teddy would say, I can be president of the United States or I can be father to Alice, but I can't do both. Um, so, you know, uh, that kind of, that kind of sums it up. But Edith, like a good stepmother, took it on um, and she did a, a very beautiful wedding for her stepdaughter, Alice, but they hired this person uh, under the, under the guise of it being a, uh, an assistant to the president for that purpose but it was really an assistant to the first lady and they stayed on uh, to assist the first lady. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, Florence Harding. Again, I said, you know, you'll hear me say this a bunch of times. I, I love talking about all these people. I, I, I would have just, I would have loved to know all these first ladies. I would have loved to have known Florence Harding just for a day. Um, she, she seemed to be quite a woman. Uh, Right, you know, right in the beginning, back when she met Warren, um, you know, she was a divorced single mother. Uh, and back then, you know, in the teens, in the 19 teens, um, that was, you know, that bordered on scandalous to be, a, you know, divorced and a single mother. And, um, and Warren was this eligible bachelor in, in Ohio that she just kind of went after him and, and uh, chased him until she got him. And uh, Warren ran a newspaper at the time. And uh, he actually, a lot of people don't know, but he actually was hospitalized for a nervous breakdown. And when that happened, she took over the newspaper and she did wonders with the, with the newspaper. She just, uh, she ruled it with an iron fist though. Uh, I mentioned that in my book, she would reward the newsboys when they did good but she wasn't above going out and spanking one on the street when he didn't do good. Uh, so she, she ran it with an iron fist, but she increased uh, subscriptions. She increased profitability uh, for, the, you know, for the newspaper. She was thrilled when Warren started to his rise in politics. Uh, she, she loved it. She wanted him to, to go into the presidency and she consulted very similar to Nancy Reagan, she was into astrology and she actually consulted a, an astrologist uh, when 
Warren was seeking the nomination for the presidency. And the astrologist, if that's the right word, the astrologist told her that Warren would win the presidency, but he would die in office. And that's exactly what did happen. Um, so those kinds of things, as a historian, just kind of sends chills up my spine. But um, she, went, she went full blast with it and, and helping him to get the presidency. And she made no secret about that she helped him to get the presidency. Uh, she said to him, well, Warren, I got you the presidency. Now, what are you going to do with it? She would go out and talk to the press and, and just, I can't even imagine that in today's uh, first lady talking to the press the way that she did. But, you know, she, she told the press, I have, I have only one real hobby and that's my husband. Um, she, she would tell them, I got Warren the presidency and uh, I put him in the White House. And the one I really like is she would tell the press, uh, the president does very well when he does what I tell him to do, and he doesn't do well when he doesn't listen to me. And can you imagine, can you imagine a first lady going out and saying that, you know, saying that now? But um, she, she suffered from uh, chronic kidney disease all her life, so she wasn't, she wasn't well either during her time as first lady, but she, uh, she was known as, as the Duchess. Um, she she was a, a, a great hostess to the White House, and she was responsible really for the first first lady to start bringing celebrities into the White House. Um, and she was very much like Eleanor Roosevelt in promoting women that were professionals, uh, women journalists. She would give preference to, uh, you know, for interviews and that type of thing. Uh, the other thing with uh, with Florence is she was very very uh big on on veterans rights and the and the care for for veterans and the one one thing i have here is a uh a photo you can see it in the bottom that's the president and first lady greeting uh soldiers and i believe probably in bethesda uh but she was she was very very much on on uh, uh, veterans. As a matter of fact, her last public appearance that she did uh, was a, uh, a parade that had veterans and she, she stood uh, as the veterans went by and that was her last public appearance before she, she passed away. Um, I wanted to go back before we get to, to Rosalind Carter. I, I forgot to show you a couple things on Edith Roosevelt that I think you would like to see. This is a cabinet card that was from a souvenir cabinet card from a visit that the president and first lady would have done. I don't know where the visit was, but this would have been around 1902 in the time of this cabinet card. So I, I really like that picture of Edith there as first lady. I have some correspondence here. This is all handwritten in Edith's hand. Uh, these three different things. And again, you can see she free, free franked the envelope at the top and signed it, as I was mentioning before with uh, Mary Dimmick. And then this is a uh, press photograph of Edith in later years. And this had something to do with her uh, appealing for the preservation of the Constitution. And I'll show you, there's the actual tape to the back, the actual newspaper uh, photo that someone clipped out and taped to the back of the press photo. Well, the last uh, of the six that I wanna talk about today is Rosalind Carter. And I'm very proud of this picture. This was just sent to me a couple of weeks ago but that's Rosalind holding my newest book. So I, I dedicated the book to her. She was very helpful in uh, giving me information uh, on writing the book. Uh, we have, for those of you who don't know, uh, my wife and I have been good friends with President and Mrs. Carter for about the last 17 years. And um, so she was very uh, happy that I, I dedicated the book, the book to her. And uh, as I mentioned, she was very helpful 
as were some of my other uh, presidential family friends and, and getting information for, for writing this book. But um, Rosalind, like the other first ladies we're talking about, is a remarkable lady as well. She, at 13, her father died and uh, in, in the small town of Plains, Georgia, and leaving her mother in, uh, you know, financial problems and uh, other kids to take care of. And so at 13 years old, Rosalind being the oldest, she, um, she took on jobs uh, in a hairdressing salon and continued to go to school. She would come home, she would go to work, she would come home and help her mother take care of the siblings, the younger siblings. And she still managed to graduate valedictorian of her class. And so I find that remarkable at, you know, at 13 years old. Um, she was always a very ch shy child and, and an adult. And she overcame that shyness uh, when she began to campaign for Jimmy Carter as governor. And, you know, she was terrified to speak to, to groups. And little did she know, and, and you know, in the following years, she'd be speaking to thousands of people and, and being first lady. But yeah, that was really a problem for her that she was, she was able to overcome in order to, to help her husband. Um, she, out of, out of all the first ladies, many of them have been partners with their husband, but Rosalind Carter has, has just been a, a partner and continues to be a partner with her husband in everything that they do. Uh, she was a partner with him when they were in the peanut business. She was a partner with him when they were in the Navy. Uh, when they came back to Plains after he resigned his commission when his father died, um, she was a partner with him and, and helped in the peanut business. She was a partner uh, when he was in the governor's mansion. And when she was gonna be first lady, um, it was gonna be no different. She was gonna be a partner in the White House as well. And at the time when she was first lady, Time Magazine called her the second most powerful person in the United States because it was evident of what a partner she was with, with President Carter. President Carter made no secret about her being his closest advisor. They would go to lunch, or they would have lunch, not go to lunch, but they would have lunch in the White House every day that they could, could do that. Uh, and he would seek you know, her advice. Um, she was really the first first lady during a, a presidential campaign to go out and campaign not only for her husband, but on behalf of herself as a first lady. I would say agenda wise, she's she's probably the most agenda driven first lady. She, you know, she promised the American people things that she would do as first lady when she was out on the campaign trail campaigning for her husband. And I I I Again, I keep saying I find these things remarkable that these first ladies did, but I do find that remarkable. That was really kind of a, a, a risky thing to do, I guess, for the lack of better terms, when you were out campaigning for your husband. But the public liked it, and she, she kept good on those campaign promises. She promised mental health, uh, you know, to take on mental health and to take on, uh, you know, caregiving. And, and the one thing that a lot of people don't know that I did put in my book quite a bit about was uh, vaccinations. And that really holds true with everything we're going through today. But she, she and, and another uh, governor's wife uh, just really put on a big crusade to, to have children vaccinated because they found that they weren't getting their vaccinations like they should. Uh, she traveled extensively on behalf of the president and as a representative of the United States. And uh, when they left the presidency after one term, she was, they were both devastated at the loss of the, the election uh, when Ronald Reagan won uh, because they had so much more that they wanted to do. Uh, but I think Rosalind was actually even more devastated than, than President Carter. She, she really had a lot of plans uh, for the two of them. And they came out, they were pretty young when they came out. And so they started the Carter Center. And uh, the Carter Center has just done remarkable things. As, as as a friend of theirs, I get asked all the time about Habitat for Humanity. And yes, they do great things with Habitat for Humanity and have lent their, their, uh, their faces to that organization. But that's, in the scheme of things, that's been such a small part of what they've done post-presidency uh, because the Carter Center has done remarkable things. We could do a whole lecture on that. Um, 
and she's uh, started the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers at Georgia Southwestern uh, University, and that's really turned into a, a major, major thing. And, and even today, she continues with things that are important to her. She's very concerned about uh, the environment. And, and I don't know if any of you have heard of the Rosalind Carter Butterfly Trail, but she recognized a few years ago that there was a, a, a very serious decline in monarch butterflies. And so she started the Rosalind Carter Butterfly Trail and has convinced people all over the, the country and beyond to start butterfly gardens and to plant milkweed. Uh, uh, she would love me right now for saying milkweed because she loves to encourage people to, to, to do that. And uh, it's really made a difference in the, in the monarch butterfly uh, population. Um, I have a, a little piece of wood here that President Carter uh, made in his wood shop and I don't know if you can read it or not, but I'll read it to you. It says, this old pine board came from Rosalind's birthplace, built by her ancestors in 1833, used often in making furniture in my wood shop, Jimmy Carter, 2017. So this was taken from Rosalind's ancestor's house and President Carter made a useful little, little thing uh, out of it. And now it's in my collection. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Rosalind, or, uh, President Carter is a uh, master woodworker and uh, has made uh, extensive pieces of furniture that have sold for over a million dollars. Um, and he's also an artist and, and he paints. Um, the Carters have just been very, very, very good to my wife and I. Uh, they love the fact that, uh, that I do the history work that I do. They are actually the ones that convinced me about three years ago, four years ago almost, uh, to, to do the history work full time. Um, it's a long story how we got affiliated, but uh, over the last 10, 11 years, we've done several programs together and, um, and they'll come to my programs if, if, if they can. And uh, they just convinced me to do it full time. So I thought, well, what historian gets convinced by a former president to, to do presidential history work and, and I'm gonna do it. So Almost four years ago now, I sold the business that we had and, and decided to do this full time, uh, but at the, at the urging of the Carters and, and of my wife. And I'll share one more piece of memorabilia with you, and then uh, we'll open it up to questions. I think we're probably time-wise about, about there. Um, this is one of my most um, cherished pieces in my collection. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll never get used to this camera when I have to go left and it goes right. Uh, but this is actually the hardbound an inaugural program that the Carters got when they went to President Obama's 2013 inauguration. And they gave it to, to my wife and I for our collection. And when you open it up, I'm trying to see where I'm at here. Can you see the signatures? It's signed by President Carter and by President Obama. And uh, it, it just as fate would have it, shortly after they gave this to me, uh, I was invited to see President Obama speak in Scranton. Probably some of you remember when, when he, as a sitting president, he and, and then Vice President Joe Biden came to Scranton. And uh, I was invited there by Matt Cartwright. And um, so I took this with me uh, in case I would get to meet the president, and I did get to meet President Obama. I told him that I was a friend of President Carter's. I don't know that he believed me on that, but uh, I asked him to sign the sign, and he did tell me to tell President Carter to sit, that he said hi. Um, and uh, and then shortly after that, the Carters came back to our house, and uh, and I asked President Carter if he would if he would sign it because uh, he, he it wasn't signed when he gave it to me, but they just thought that I would like that for the, uh, for our collection. So in closing, I'll just say, you know, you just think about the first lady, uh, the position of the first lady, it's still a non-paid position. Um, of course, now they do have a, a budget and, and, uh, and that, but there is no job description. There is no uh, paycheck for the first lady. Um, 
and when you think about it, they're in, in one of the most scrutinized positions in the world, uh, from their hairstyle to the shoes they have on to the, the, the clothes they wear. Uh, and it goes far beyond their duties in the White House as First Lady. I mean, you, and you think about that, uh, you know, they're, they're a wife, they're a mother. Uh, they've got all those other things on their plate, and it's 24-7, not just the wife and the mother thing, but also the job of their husband is is 24-7. So any of these ladies that we talked about today, any of the other first ladies, um, maybe if you have me back some other time, we can talk about some other ones, talk about some other presidents, but they all have amazing stories uh, behind them, and and I like to say they're they're just People like you and me who were just thrown into ordinary circum or extraordinary circumstances and and stepped up to it. And so with that, I will open it up to any questions. I'll be glad to uh, to take any questions and try to answer them for you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cook, for sharing your your stories and your and your collection. I'm I'm a little jealous that I'm also not friends with Jefferson Davis's great grandson. But you know, there are many things I'm jealous about in this story. Um, I know you mentioned at the beginning, um, you're talking about the GAR. I know we have a, a few GAR members here, um, maybe Carol and Mary Jane and I think Mary Louise. Um, but if, if anyone has any, any questions, um, please, please chime in. Um, I was muting people as we were going. Um, so please unmute yourselves if you have questions. I have a question. Okay, Christine. Um, it was a very, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And I was wondering, what is the oldest piece of memorabilia you might have? Uh, the oldest piece that I have is a document signed by Thomas Jefferson as president. And it's, uh, I believe, 1803. And uh, the nice thing about that document, too, not that, I mean, that's a nice thing that's signed by him, but it's also signed by James Madison, who, who was his secretary of state at the time. So uh, very, very proud of that. Uh, you know, several years ago, I would have never dreamt of a lot of things that are in my life right now, but I would have never dreamt that I would have a Thomas Jefferson signed document, but uh, I do. So that would be the oldest piece. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Any other I questions? Question. Yeah. Um, I have attended several of your programs and presentations and I'm always impressed. Uh, even each one seems to be even better than the one before, but uh, there was an interesting thing about uh, President Grant that you mentioned, and you did not mention in this program, it might be of interest to the other people. How did President Grant get his first initial, his middle initial? Ah, yes, uh, there, there, there are actually several uh, presidents that their birth names are different than, uh, than their uh, name that they go by. Uh, but he was actually born uh, Hiram Ulysses Grant and if you look at those initials, what do those initials spell? H-U-G, hug. And uh, when he applied for, uh, for West Point, uh, for some reason or another, whoever was admitting him put his name down as Ulysses S. Grant. Well, U.S. Grant, in a patriotic place like West Point, those U.S. is a lot better uh, initials than hug. So uh, he just went with it and uh, kept that kept that name. And so uh, thank you for thank you for asking that. Do you have Dr. Cook in, in your in your research? Do you have a first lady who is a favorite beyond Rosalind Carter with a, a personal connection? Um, do you have a, a favorite? You know, uh, I, I get asked that now on first ladies, and and I, but I, I over the years get asked that on presidents, same question, but presidents. And what I, what my answer to that is, is that's kind of like asking a, a grandfather who your favorite grandchild is. Uh, you know, I really do, I really do like them all, and, and that's not just a cop out answer. Um, you know, of course, I have, I have favorite things about different different ones. You know, of course, Teddy Roosevelt's always a big favorite. You know, he's, you know, so I, I would rank him up there as, as, as one of the tops. And of course, Abraham Lincoln, um, as far as the presidents go, I know you ask about first ladies. Um, the first ladies, like I said, I, I, I admire them all. Um, these six that are here today, I really enjoy talking about. 
you know, I think, again, that my answer there is I like them all. I admire them uh, as a favorite for, for a few different reasons. I, I admire Francis for being a 21-year-old first lady. I mean, I, I almost can't even fathom that. Um, you know, I admire Florence, like I said, for, for all that she did for her husband. But uh, the, the main thing is, I think, with these first ladies, is that I think a lot of them, had it not been for them, their husband could have never been president or would not have been successful uh, even in their life before the presidency had it not been for them. So I can't really pick out an, an exact favorite besides Rosalind, um, but for different reasons, like I said, same as, as the presidents. Very good, that's, that's fair. The old, old saying is that behind every strong man is every, behind every successful man is a strong woman. So. We, we need them too. Um, Professor Stanko, do you have a question? I see your hand. Yes, I have a couple of comments and I have a question. Okay. Um, um, I, I think my favorite first lady after studying them is Louisa Catherine Adams because okay. John Quincy Adams was tough. Yes. He was tough. And the story about her traveling across Russia to reach him was to me just amazing. And also Grace Coolidge and Lou Hoover. Lou Hoover was so smart. Yes. You know, with her and 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 I don't think people realize the accomplishments on their own of these people. And um Betty Ford as well. Betty Ford Betty Ford as well. Now my two questions. Do you think that one of the reasons that Rosalind Carter was able to be the first lady to promote her own agenda because it was the 70s and the roles of women were being examined more with the women's movement and that was more acceptable? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that statement Do at you all. you think? Um, you know, um, I wanted to say this first before I finish answering that, but you sound a lot like me when, when you were saying, I, my favorite first lady is this one, but I also like this one, and oh, and this one, and, and this one. The more you think about it, you know, you, you, you get them all there. Um, yeah. So I, I like the fact that you, that you said that. Um, but yeah, getting back to, to the question on Rosalind, um, yeah, I think, that, I think the time had a lot to do with it. Um, you know, Rosalind was very, uh, and, and continues to be very disappointed that the ERA uh, thing has never come to, to fruition, you know, um, she was, you know, of course, very much for that and still is. Uh, but, but yes, I, I think so. And to go beyond that a little bit with Rosalind, you know, she overcame that shyness. Um, and to the point where, and I'm not speaking for her, because she never said this exactly, but my observation of it, that she worked hard to overcome that shyness. And I think she, once she did that, she knew she had a voice and she wasn't just a, a, a you know, be seen, not heard type person. And she, you know, I, I laugh even when we're together and we're doing events together uh, because if President Carter has the microphone and, you know, he gets done talking, she'll say, hey, I, I want to say something now. Give me the microphone, you know, and, uh, and so she'll, she'll take the microphone or or same with me when I've been talking, you know, and and uh, and she'll she'll say, you know, could I say something? You know, I'd like to say that. Sure, you know, and I, and I hand her the microphone. So she over, you know, she worked hard to overcome that. That was that was really something that you know a lot of people say, oh, you know, they were shy. Well, she was beyond shy. You know, it was something she really had to work to overcome. And once she did, and she had a voice, I think she was proud of the fact that she had a voice and and would make it heard. You had another question? I had one more question. Yeah. Sure. Um, she's one of my favorite first ladies, but, and when I say this to people, they, why? Mary Todd Lincoln is one of okay. my favorite first ladies. <laughs> Would you comment on the relationship at all between Mary Todd Lincoln and Julia Grant? Uh, it, it wasn't real good. I can't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Mary Todd Lincoln was like you said, Mary Todd Lincoln. Favorite. You know, yeah, and, and, and I like it, you know, because uh, you and I, I, we could talk for hours because we're on the same wavelength, I think, with things. 
because I'm like I'm I'm like you with her. She she really uh, ranks up there as one of my favorites. I think she got kind of a bad rap actually in a lot of ways, uh, but she was a say what's on your mind type of person. She had a, a jealousy streak in there with other with other women. I think which Julia. which kind of yeah. And Julia was around a lot, you know, you figure Ulysses was the famous, I mean, he was as famous as the president was at, at that time. And um, so anytime they they interacted, uh, Julia tried to keep it, keep it, you know, cool uh, when they were, you know, together. But uh, she was known to say a few things to, to, uh, to Julia that would come off as, as rude. Uh, I know there was one time where uh, they were, they were going to meet the president and um, Julia just happened to be a, a few steps ahead of her and uh, she didn't like that. Um, you know, she, she, with her comments, she turned a lot of people, uh, you know, off, but I think she did get a bad rap uh, in a lot of ways. And she had a very, very difficult life with the loss of her sons and, and the loss of her husband and, uh, and all of that. But uh, but yeah, it was that they were not best friends. That's for sure. <laughs> so uh, yeah. the one thing that I want to uh, say about that too is, uh, you know, that may have saved Ulysses' life that they weren't the best of friends because they were scheduled to go to the theater with the Lincolns on right. that fateful night, and I think that probably part of them not going was the relationship between Julia and Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, you know, had they been best buddies, I think it would have been more likely that they would have went. Uh, you know, they were invited to go and, and they, they chose not to go. And I think probably that was a big part of it. And it may very well have saved uh, Grant's life. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you again, Dr. Cook, for joining us and for sharing your, your knowledge and your collections with our, our members. Um, it was an excellent program, uh, something, so a, gr a great tribute to these women that we usually don't talk as much about. Um, that was an excellent, excellent program. Um, please join us again next in the, for our next our next series for Lackawanna Pastimes um, on May 21st. Uh, we'll be continuing our, our theme this month of special programs. Um, in the end of May, we'll be joined by Dr. Bill Conlog, uh, professor at Marywood and a historian and author from Marywood University. Um, he will be talking about mind subsidence. Uh, this year is the 100th anniversary of the Kohler and Fowler Acts. Uh, it was the first state, leg state legislation that protected property owners from mine subsidence. Uh, so we're we'll looking at, at that anniversary uh, and be joined by Bill Conlog talking about mine subsidence in the Lackawanna Valley. So please tune in again uh, May 21st at two o'clock for that program. Uh, thank you again for, for joining us. Have a lovely weekend and happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. <laughs>